One of the most incredible heroes of World War II was a middle-aged Dutch woman. Let's talk about her with Larry Loftus on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. You always have a place at our table. And in case you're wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is here. He's our executive producer. Matthew, uh, you said you have a new eating plan that's working. Tell us about it. Yeah, intermittent fasting. You just kind of skip breakfast, and it's been it's easy. It's going great. Um, also, I now eat lunch at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> so, this is great. This is great. Our producer, Jinx, is back in the little glass booth. Jinx, it's good to see you, man, and your hair. It's good to see you as well. (laughs) (laughs) Our video director and one-man IT department is John Myers. He's in his tech bunker. We're just now getting sort of used to this new studio, updated version of our studio. And if you're not seeing us on YouTube, you're just... You're just missing out. And Dr. George Bean. I'm seeing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> just leave it alone, okay? <laughs> and Dr. Be George sharing. Bingham is the president of Key Life. George, thanks for letting John do all this cool stuff. Did he swipe the Key Life credit card to get all this? <laughs> and can we pay for it? He swiped it several times. <laughs> <laughs> And Kathy Wyatt is the soft, feminine side of the program. Uh, She baked cookies for us today, both in the control room and the studio. We have a big plate, and they have a little plate, but Jinx, unbeknownst to us, switched them. And so he's got more cookies than (laughs) he deserves. Speaking of swiping. Yeah. (laughs) And and Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. I won't say that Kathy is too into details, but it does bother her that the letters OCD aren't in alphabetical (laughs) order. (laughs) Oh, man. We're just getting used to all the fancy new stuff in the studio, and we're quite pleased. Uh, but if bad things happen during this program, it's not us. <laughs> it's, it's your it's YouTube. Us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, we have a great guest today, and we have a great subject. His name is Larry Loftus, and he is the New York Times and international best-selling author of three nonfiction thrillers. Thrillers. Uh, prior to becoming a full-time writer... He worked as a corporate attorney and an adjunct professor of law. He was a failure at both. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so he started, he started writing. And Larry's latest book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is The Watchmaker's Daughter, The True Story of World War II heroine Corey Ten Boom. Larry, it's so good to have you with us. Thank you, Steve. You, Great uh, to be here. You know, I got, uh, you don't know her, but I knew her. I, uh, shortly really? before her death, I had, a, I had lunch with her in her hotel room, and everybody was saying we were having an affair. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she, was, uh, she was very old in those days, and she needed to rest because she was going to be speaking that evening. And that was uh, one of the great memories of, of my life. Uh, I don't know if you know, but everybody around this table and in the control room knows that I'm a cynical old preacher. And uh, I'm probably more cynical about Christian celebrities than anybody else other than myself. I'm cynical about me, so that keeps me from being too self-righteous. 
But I'll tell you something. Uh, Corey Tinboom was the real deal. I mean, you could sense. She smelled like Jesus. You could sense uh, her love, uh, what she had gone through, and some of the stories she shared with me. If I had known you were writing this book, I would have told you some of those stories <laughs> and expected some kind of commission for having <laughs> shared them with you. The paperback. Paperback. <laughs> yeah, <to> right. <laughs> uh, listen, Larry, uh, I can't imagine anybody who's watching or who's listening who doesn't know who Corey Ten Boom is. But maybe you ought to. But there will be some. So would you talk about her, who she was, maybe a quick overview so people will know that we're talking about an incredible, unbelievable lady? Sure. She was Dutch and came from a very uh, devout religious family, uh, the Ten Boom family. And her main inspiration, which is one of the things I wanted to add into the book is, and this is just the 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 arc, the advanced reader copy. The hardback doesn't come out until um, isn't released until March seven. But one of the reasons that I wrote the book is because the hiding place only told about ten percent of the story, maybe less than that. Yeah. And one of the big parts that that was not in there was about her father, Casper Ten Boom, who was a really a, in his day a famous watchmaker, maybe the best watchmaker in the world, but certainly the best watchmaker in the Netherlands. And that's who trained Corey. She she essentially apprenticed for him and and did it for the rest of her professional career until you know the war and 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 the whole family's arrested. But that was her mentor, very devout man, very godly man. The uh, Corey's mom had passed away years earlier. So it was just Father Casper um and uh Willem her brother had already married and moved out and and Nolly her sister had married and moved out so it was just her and Betsy her Betsy and Casper were there and the Baye as their house was known and uh just watching what they did on a daily basis uh you, you kind of feel guilty <laughs> you know i mean their their day starts with prayer ends with prayer starts with bible study ends with bible study they read a verse. Casper reads a, something from the Psalms before every meal. I mean, it was really they 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 were genuine Christians um, in that day. And uh, if you, they did a film called The Hiding Place based on a book of the same name, uh, and uh, that book has sold millions. And yeah. and that film, I think it was done by the Graham Association. And she used to very often speak at uh, Graham Crusades mm -hmm. with hundreds of thousands of people watching and thousands in the stadium. And she was, um, she traveled, uh, it, it, even when she was too old to travel, she was um, an internationally known speaker and writer who was used in an amazing way by the God she worshiped. What, now, that's stuff that most people know if they're at all aware of of uh, the the Second World War and the Holocaust or Shoah. Um, what, what prompted you to write this book? Uh, my prior three, I, I write about World War II uh, stories, and my prior three books were all about spies. Um, I had one spy that the first book in the lion's mouth was Dusko Popov, who was Ian Fleming's inspiration for Bond. He he operated out of he was MI6, MI5 agent from the UK, and he operated out of Portugal. So that was the first book. Second book was a spy uh, named Odette Sampson, who was French, but she had been living in the, the, the UK uh, in, in uh, Britain, and she operated in France. She was with the SOE, one of the one of the British kind of sabotage spy agencies. And then my third one was the Princess Spy, which is about Elaine Griffith, who was an American spy, OSS, who operated in Spain. So I wanted to do another, I wanted to stay in my genre and do another book on another spy um, in another country. I'd already covered you know, the UK and I'd covered France and I'd covered Spain and, and uh, Portugal. So I wanted a new country and I wanted a new spy agency. Well, I'd already covered them all. 
<laughs> and then a friend of mine who had read and 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 talked me into reading The Hiding Place when I was writing um, Codename Lease, said, you got to read The Hiding Place. And I said, why? I, I knew about Corey and I knew about the story, but I'd never read the book. Uh-huh. And she said, well, because Odette, uh, my, my second book, Second Spy, was imprisoned at the Ravensbrück concentration camp for women. Well, lo and behold, Corey was there at the same time. And my uh, subject was in a bunker most of the time. So she doesn't see anything. She's in a, you know, basically a closet with no lights and she never sees anything. Well, Corey was on the outside. So I was able to get a perspective of someone on the outside of Ravensbrook and, and what happened around the barracks and all that and daily uh, that I couldn't I couldn't get from from my own subject. So that book helped me to uh, understand what was happening on the outside of the prison, the outside of the uh, bunker. So when it came time to uh, do another one, I, it just kept coming up on mine. Why not Corey? Why not? This is her story. She wasn't a spy, but she was in the French, she was in the Dutch resistance. Oh, and um, and it has the same thriller aspect that, that uh, normal thrillers do. So I said, let's do a new country and a new a new agency. Well, we, I'm glad uh, that it worked out because this is a great book. It's called The Watchmaker's Daughter. The true story of World War II heroine Corey Tinboom. Guys, you don't want to miss a word of this. This is going to be a great hour. So hang on. Like Jesus, we're going to return. Joining us, uh, we're talking with Larry Loftus, and his latest book is called The Watchmaker's Daughter, the true story of World War II heroine, Corey Ten Boom. So, Larry, before the break, we kind of set the table on this thing, you know, and obviously, like Steve said, most people are familiar with the name, but let's, I, I would love to get into the actual, you know, any kind of uh, story or screenplay, there's an inciting incident. You know, it's the thing that happened of why this woman was not some anonymous person we've never heard of who went on to be like a great watchmaker. So so what happened? What was this inflection point that pulled her into this larger sure. drama? The, the inciting incident? Yes. The, there were sort of two, and, and, and one was mostly innocuous. The second was pretty significant. So uh, the first one... Uh, the Nazis control the, the SS base. The Gestapo controls the Netherlands. I mean, they 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 are rounding up Jews, and they're also rounding up another group of people, which are kind of forgotten. And those are Dutch boys between the ages of about sixteen to thirty-five, and they would be snatched off the street and sent to work in a German factory, mostly never to be seen again. Um, so both groups of people needed to hide. Jews needed to hide and Dutch boys needed to hide. And so the the insight, the, the, the first incident that happens is somebody knocks on the door. It's a Jewish woman. She needs refuge. And so she stays a couple of nights. Then another one and, they, and she stays a couple of nights. And then about three, after about three people have stayed there for a night or so, um, she takes in a Dutch boy. They're, they're called divers named Hans Poli. He was the first permanent person in refugee, if you will, into the Bay and stayed the longest. And so he, and by the way, he's not even in the hiding place. He was in Corey's autobiography, A Prisoner and Yet, which came out 1947, mm-hmm. two years after the war. Um, but for some reason, he's not even in the, the hiding place. Anyway, when he's there, he, he, he really wants to help the resistance. So he secretly joins and knows that's going to bring additional risk to the family. Because if you're a member of the Dutch resistance, number one, if you get caught, you'll be executed. No questions asked. And maybe the people, you know, who are who are helping you, who are assisting you. So he thought, I better tell Corey because if if she doesn't know and I get caught, they're at risk. So he told her, he said, hey, look, I, I, I got a fake ID now. I'm with the resistance and there's additional risk and I'm sorry, but I have to do something. I have to help. 
Um, he would go out like on run on, on runs as a runner, dressed as a girl, dressed, you know, dressed there, everything on a bike, dressed as a girl. And Corey said, Well, look, if you're gonna do that, we I want to help. We we want to help. Use the, the bay and use our house as your home base, as the headquarters. And he said, Okay. Mm. So from that point on, they're in. So then they start taking in more Jews and more Dutch boys. And at any given time, they might have 10. You know, they might have five Jews and five Dutch boys that are all hiding there uh, in this one house. And uh, so it, it basically ratchets up from there because the Gestapo is very good at tracking down resistance. You know, they could torture people. They would threaten their families with arrest and so forth. So they were very good at finding out once they got somebody, who else? Give me names. Give me names. And so it was a, there's a ticking clock. It's a matter of time. Before the Gestapo figures out, hey, there's something going on in this tin boom house, and we need to break in and find out. Hmm. Hmm. And they had fitted it out to accommodate in uh, these 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 folks that they were hiding. Correct? Talk, can you talk to a little bit about that? Sure. Or... The, the name "the hiding place" comes from uh, basically where they hid people. When when a number of Dutch boys came in, um, Hans Poli said, you know, we've got to have a place to hide people. We, we don't have any place in the house. So he cut a hole. He checked the attic and tried to get, you know, they tested the time, how long <clears throat> it took to people to get up in the attic. And it was too long. So he hammered that one shut and he found a new place and he cut a hole in their ceiling uh, in the attic for a new entrance. They tested it, still too long, took too long. And Hans is like, well, I don't know what else to do. I mean, we've, we've tried this a couple of times. I don't know where else. And Corey said, let me ask somebody. I know this guy, and he has all the answers, a very wealthy Dutch man um, who lived not far from them. And sure enough, that man sent over uh, an architect who apparently did this in multiple houses. <laughs> so he toured their home and got in, finally ended up in Corey's room. And he said, this is it. This is the room. We're going to put a false wall right there, and no one will ever know. And that's what they did. So this space, and basically it's the size of a closet. It's it's about two feet by, you know, maybe eight feet. They could stuff in as many as eight people. That was it. I mean, six was crowded, but eight was max. So they had a little secret entrance. They had built a linen closet on the side, and they had a secret entrance underneath. And so that became the hiding place. Uh, which was basically like a coffin if you were in there for more than, you know, five hours. Mm. Mm. Did you ever, did you visit? Is that house still standing? It's still, not only is it still standing, it's exactly the same because they preserved it. It's not, it that house, and it's the, the watch shop is at the bottom, like most European places, you have the retail on the bottom, the residential above that. So the bottom is the retail, that's the Ten Boom watch shop. And then the two floors above are residential. So um, it still exists. It is now owned by and is the Corey Ten Boom Museum. Hmm. So I was planning to go there back two years ago when I was doing research. And um, but this was during COVID. Mm, so yeah. the Netherlands basically cut off. So that, but they have they've got a website and I can, they, you can visually tour it. They, they've done a very good job. And they've got quotes from Hans Poli and, and a number of other people that stayed there. But you can really get a good sense because they take the camera in and you can see the space. Oh. Larry, wow. my uh, my daughter just recently visited the Netherlands, and one of the highlights was visiting the Corey Tinboom house. Um, uh, she had gotten an interest in it when she was in college and had an opportunity to go there, spend a, a time there, and just the way the guides take them through and tell the story and so forth. They've just apparently done a really good job of, you know, highlighting the inspiration of the story uh, associated with it, uh, associated with the museum. Um, Indeed. Um, I spent four, Corey's archives are all at the, um, in the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. So I spent four days in her archives going through everything. And there are a lot of pictures of the Bay, even from the inside. And so I look at those pictures, which were taken during the war, you know, between, you know when, when the refugees started staying there in, in 44 and then 45. And if you look at the videos of, of the Bay A now, it's pretty much identical. I mean, they've changed one room, but it's pretty much identical the way it was. Mm. 
Oh man. Well, we you have another question, but we're not there. We we'll hold that. <laughs> it will be a profound, incredible, <laughs> yeah, uh, sterling question. Get ready. And uh, I trust that Larry will be able to answer it. <laughs> His book is The Watchmaker's Daughter, the true story of World War II heroine Corey Ten Boom. We don't have people like her much anymore. Uh, a lady who stood and paid a big price for it and uh, who is now in heaven wearing the crowns that are hers for going through this. Listen, don't go anywhere or you'll get the fever and die. part of this and in our new studio uh, we do have a place for you anytime you want to join us uh, we're hanging out with Larry Loftus and you can keep up with him at LarryLoftus.com and on Twitter at Larry Loftus um, Larry uh, a lot of people have heard of and read and seen the movie for the hiding place um, what what made you decide that you know, there was more to be written with the watchmaker's sure. daughter. So when I read The Hiding Place, uh, I, 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 I just felt like there's got to be more to this story. And, and that's what I do is I dig, I research. And, and because all of my prior spies, all there had been a biography about them or an autobiography. And so I knew from practice, there's probably a lot more. So I needed to answer that question before I decided to write the book. So I ordered every book about her that, that hmm. has ever been written. And, and, and there were a couple of them that were particularly helpful. Hans Poli, who was the, as I mentioned last hour, was the first refugee there and stayed longer than anybody and was the one that got them involved in resistance. He's not even in the story. And in 1983, he wrote his own book uh, called Return to the Hiding Place. So he's, and he kept a diary. So Unlike Corey, who, who did not keep a diary, when, when the Sheryls actually wrote The Hiding Place, they're, they're talking to Corey, and she's doing everything by memory from 35 years ago. Mm. Hans had actually kept a diary. So I've got a day-by-day day through the whole exciting part wow. of what happened, um, not only to him, but everything that happened in the house. So um, that was a huge help. And then in um, 1954... Corey's nephew, Peter, Peter Van Warden, who was Nolly's son, he had written his own book about all of this uh, called The Secret Place. And that's not mentioned in the book. And, and what he's writing about of what happened, because he was there too, um, none of that's in the book either. So I just found all of these things. And of course, they didn't have access to Corey's files, her archives, which are all in the, uh, in the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. So I knew with all this information, I'm like, there's, I've got to dig into all of this. And so my conclusion when I was finished was the hiding place is less than 10% of the story. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, and it really does. I mean, I think you've done a great job. It really does read like a yeah. spy novel almost in, in presenting that. And especially the, also with the history, World War II history with that. And, and you've, put a lot of that uh, kind of detailed history in it, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, the other thing that I wanted to do, and this I've tried to do this with all of my books, is when we read about a person, most of the time there's not a lot of depth about what's going on around them. So if you look at the hiding place, for example, there's nothing about what the Germans are doing. Mm. There's nothing about what the British are doing. Um, there's nothing about who is actually what the Gestapo is doing. Who, who's in charge of a guy by the name of Router? was this notorious SS uh, psychopath, basically. Um, and then the person that was in charge of, of Amsterdam and, and, and basically all of the Netherlands, another psychopath. 
So that's an integral, integral part of the story, as well as the people around them who are suffering. Did you know that just a few miles, 10 miles from where Corey is, there was another very young person who was hiding. Her name was Anne Frank. Mm. And of course, the Anne Frank diary. So of course, I had to read those. And that's she's writing about what's happening in that area at the same time of, of our story. Mm. So, I've, so I, I brought in the Anne Frank side of it. And then there's another woman who's there at the same time about Anne Frank's age. And her name is Audrey Hepburn. Mm-hmm. Uh, Audrey Hepburn oh was in Arnhem, also very close to Harlem, where Corey was. And so she's got her own perspective of what was going on around them at the same time, what the what she was seeing. So so with both of these other sources, what they were seeing. So I had all of these sources between those two women and 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 Hans Poli and um, the archives and Peter Van uh, Van Warden. Uh, so it just allowed me to see the whole big picture and bring it all together. Hmm. Was this life changing to you in the way maybe your other books weren't? Yeah. You know, Steve, I, I remember when I left seminary, uh, um, you know, I went there cause there was this great professor named Steve Brown there. But when I was in seminary, uh, I, I, I initially thought I wanted to pastor and then I thought I want to be a theologian. And then eventually God led me to, to doing what I'm doing now, which is writing writing um, nonfiction thrillers. But I always felt a little, not odd, but like I wanted to be able to use my seminary training. And um, the three books that I've written about, none of those were Christians, so there's nothing I can really bring in there. Mm. Well, this story is a Christian story from cover to cover. Mm. So <laughs> in that sense, I was like, finally, I get to write about something that's going to be moving for me as well as everybody else. Yeah. And when you read about Corey, you know, the biggest thing that take away from Corey's book is, is not just that she suffered. There are a lot of millions of people suffered. It's that she forgave everyone. Yeah. She forgave the Germans. She forgave her, forgave her SS guards who were really cruel. Um, and then she forgave the Dutch persons that betrayed them, that sent them all to concentration camps. She forgave Ooh. everybody. Collaborator. Yeah. Oh man, that yeah, blows yeah, your yeah. way. We're going to talk more about that on the other side of the break. And you're crazy if you go anywhere. Hey, we're so glad you're with us. By the way, we have a new free Key Life app that's available for both iPhone and Droid. And Android. Be sure and check it out. Maybe tell a friend. Go to keylife.org/slash app. We're going to return, so don't you dare go anywhere. What a great hour. Uh, uh, Corey Tinboom is one of my uh, few heroes. Uh, she's the real deal. And uh, her godliness, which wasn't self-righteous, uh, she very much understood herself and the gospel. She wasn't self-righteous. She just smelled like Jesus. And the time I was with her, it absolutely blew me away. And I still think about that time. By the way, we're talking to Larry Loftus in a very good book that you're going to love called The Watchmaker's Daughter, The True Story of World War II Heroine, Corey Ten Boom. Uh, Larry, I, it seems like there's kind of, you could think of it as kind of three phases. I mean, there's the the time during the war when she was, actually providing sanctuary for people from the Nazis and then in the concentration camp and the suffering and so forth that she went through. And then there was another really important phase of the story after the war when she was ended up providing sanctuary for refugees returning from concentration camps and others who ended up suffering in the 
during the war and the immediate aftermath. Can you talk a little bit about that part of the story? Sure. When they're in the concentration camp, Betsy is dying. And she tells Corey one day, we have to do something to help these people, everybody, the people that suffer during the war, people that were in concentration camps, prison guards, German prison guards who you know, feel guilty for what they did. Mm. And, and she said, we have to help them. There are going to be millions of homeless Germans. We have to help them somehow. And Corey's like, well, how? And Betsy's vision was they would have a house. They would have a house where they could bring people in to basically get over all the hurts and all the terrible things they had seen, terrible things they had experienced. And so it happened in three stages. The first one was they met a woman who said, after hearing Corey talk, said, Corey, I I have a very big house. And she said her name, and Corey knew immediately this woman came from a very rich family, and they had this mansion. And she said, my sons, I had five sons, and four of them are dead from the war. I have one left. I don't know where he is. But I want you to use my house for that center that you were talking about to help Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So she moves out. The woman moves out, and Corey moves in, and they start bringing in all of these people who had been hurt and devastated. In that area, this is in this is in Harlem, so it would have been Dutch people, uh, and it was very successful. They had all the, there was a waiting list to get in. It was free. The waiting list people could come and go as they please. Corey might teach a, a Bible study or something at night, and and they basically otherwise could do whatever they wanted. They would go out at night, walk around the city. Some people would just stay in the room, but they were healing. And then after that, there was another group that Corey said, "Well, what about all the people, the worst?" who were the traitors, the the Dutch people who had betrayed their own people to help the Nazis um, and, 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 and were turning in people like Corey. What about them, these pariahs? Corey said, we need a place for them. So Corey tried to move some of them into this, this beautiful mansion, but the people there who had suffered at the hands of those other people, you know, they started fights, get them out. Mm. So Corey moved them into her own home, the Bay Egg. Her father had died, Betsy uh, had died, so it's now that Corey's in this other place, it's empty. So Corey moves these other people into her own home. These are the and, collaborators, um, right? And, and, yeah, these are the collaborators, and, and that gave them the same kind of healing on their own. And then finally, she felt like, well, I remember Betsy said, we need to help the Germans. How am I going to help the Germans? So when she was speaking in Germany, somebody came up to her and said, hey, we've got a place kind of like what you're doing in Holland, do you think you can use it? And it was a former concentration camp in Whoa. Germany at Darmstead. So he said, come with me. We have the right to use this. We'll help you rehab it. So Corey went to this place, this former concentration camp in Darmstead. I've got pictures in the book that are both before and after when it had all the barbed wire, this concentration camp. And Corey, when she saw it, said, we're going to paint everything, you know, the inside green, the color of things growing, the color of spring. We're going to put flowers. We're going to put planter boxes at every window, at every, you know, all the way around this place, flowers outside. And when you see the after pictures, that's exactly what she did. And then there was a waiting list to get into that. So there was that that held like 160, 70 people. So there was a waiting list to get into that place. Hmm. And then there was a third place she went to, a bombed out factory where about 100 people were were staying. I'll save that for the story because I don't want to Put in a spoiler there because it's another very interesting story. So she's doing all of this on her own, helping people oh, man. For, for no reason other than altruism. You know, she wants to to, to help them. Larry, would you just um because we're we're actually coming up at for coming pretty close to the end here, would you just say a little bit? I know that that um that Bessie died, that her dad died, her mother was already gone. There was a brother also. So are there still um Ten Boom family that are still um, uh, still alive today, or do they have anything to do with, you know, keeping the the home uh, over there going, et cetera, and so forth? Because it was just the one, the one brother that married, right, and had a family. Right. She only had one brother, Willem, and and Willem died. He, he he went to a concentration camp as well, and and he got tuberculosis, and 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 he dies. So everybody around Corey's dying. Um, the, to answer your question, there's not anyone left that was that would have been in the story. I mean, could there be, you know, a re, maybe Peter's 
uh, Betsy and Corey had no children, so it, it would only be from Nolly's children or from um, Willem's children. Um, and it's possible, but all the people that would have known about the story all dead. I mean, Pete, I would have loved to have talked to Peter, for example, because he was there. Right. Um, but uh, that's the problem I have with writing World War II stories. All the people that were there are all dead. So yeah. I have to go to archives. Larry, um, we have one minute left. Uh, you got to say something about the forgiveness that came from this woman. Yeah, that, I think Corey herself would say that's the heart of the story. Millions of people suffered during the war. Millions were executed. Millions went to concentration camps. So Corey's not unique in that. Where she's unique is she forgave everybody. She forgave her captors. She forgave the Germans. She even forgave, as I mentioned, the person who betrayed them, sent him a letter, shared the gospel with him. And that's not easy to do. She had a guard come up to her uh, at, after she had spoken at a church who was particularly evil and cruel and asked her forgiveness. And, and at first, Corey thought, I can't, I can't, I hate this man. But she just said, Lord, I'm going to lift my hand. You do the rest. And, and God did. And, and she felt a love for him and she forgave him on the spot. Oh, man. Larry, we're at the end. And I don't know where this hour went. It just, it just vanished. This is such a good book, and we rise up and call you blessed uh, for uh, writing it. And by the way, you get three free sins every time you come on this program. <laughs> and I have it on good authority that you're way behind. <laughs> Larry, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Hey, guys, we're going to come back and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. Uh, also, this is very hard work. Uh, we're going to have some cookies and some milk. We still have some left. Take a nappy nap. And then, like Jesus, we're going to return. Hope you do, too. It. If you're just turning in now, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You missed you, you missed a one. This is a great book, and you got to get it. Some of us have read the whole book, and I've just started it this morning. But I, I'm going to have trouble putting this down. It's a great. It's not what you think. Just a religious book that says religious things about religious people. It is a great story, written by a great writer, and you ought to get it. Uh, and the forgiveness thing. Man, if we need anything in our world, that's what we need. You know, we complain about a cancel culture. We complain about uh, identity politics. We complain about how we're killing each other off. And nobody talks of the solution being forgiveness. Because nobody wants to admit that they're screwed up. And everybody is, and it's universal. And a superficial understanding of evil will put you at odds with the reality of the world. That's the problem with our culture. It's a problem with virtue signaling. It's the problem with people who are self-righteous. You just can't face the reality of their sin, but more important, you can't face the reality of your own. And Corey Ten Boom is, man, she was a Protestant, Calvinist, of, but of course. <laughs> but, she, but she also, if we had sainthood and we could vote, she would be right at the top of the pyramid just because she got forgiveness. And if we don't get forgiveness, we're going to be lost. If we don't learn to forgive each other, recognizing that we're all fallen and the heart is deceitful above all things, we're, gonna, we're not going to solve our problems. Our problems are beyond us. And you've got to go to God. 
And I didn't say what I just said. He did. I'm just repeating it. So there. Kathy, who's going to be on next week? Next week we have uh, J.D. Greer um, on our program. It's been a while. Um, he hasn't written a book in, in a little bit of time. Yeah, uh, anyway, um, he has a new book out called Essential Christianity, and we like him a lot, so hopefully we're going to like him this time too. I sure have liked him Ti- before. Title sounds boring. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll see what I can do about finding another guest. <laughs> no, just no, no. have him change the title. <laughs> yeah, just change the title. Just give the book a code name. <laughs> He's certainly not boring, and you'll want to join us. And we will be here next week, same time, same place. It's our hope that you'll join us. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth. Oh, we got through. Yeah, it did. It worked. It worked. You know, I.